the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 2 Peter 3, 9. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life, eternal life. John 3, 16. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I am here to, um, I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share the gospel, which is the good news. Um, what is the good news? Well, it's that Jesus Christ came down to earth. He was born as a baby in a manger. He's God. God became flesh. He lived a perfect life without sin. Not once did he sin his entire life. And then he was crucified. Um, he was crucified for our sins, which is the whole reason he came here. Because we needed a sacrifice. A, 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 the, um, in Israel, they would sacrifice animals yearly um, to pay for the sins of everyone. But this had to be repeated over and over and over again. Um, because, because we continue sinning. And um, Jesus came down and he became the sacrifice once and for all. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he rose again three days later. There were, what, 500 witnesses um, that saw him. He rose again from the dead, defeating death, defeating Satan. He ascended into heaven and he is there making a place for us right now. He went to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back. Now, he will be coming back um, during the rapture. He'll be coming to the cloud. He'll meet us in the clouds. He's not going to come to the earth. He's not going to set foot on the earth. He's going to rapture all the children of God. will will meet him in the clouds. And the second coming will be seven years later. Um, when we meet Jesus in the cloud, we're going to be with him forever. The ones who believe in Jesus now, the, the ones that Jesus know, his sheep, um, we are his sheep. And we will be meeting him in the clouds, in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. Seven years, we'll be going to like, so basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going up to the bridal supper, um, the wedding supper, the um, the redemption of the church and reunite and we're reunited with Jesus the end of sin we will no longer suffer we will no longer have pain we're going to this beautiful banquet that the Lord has prepared for us and then after the seven years that seven years on earth is the tribulation many people who see the rapture are going to they're going to know because we've told them they're going to know what happened and they're going to hit their knees and they're going to pray but it's not going to be a good time here Christians will be murdered they will be beheaded. They will be imprisoned. They, you, they won't be able to buy or sell anything. They will lose everything they own and have nowhere to go. They will have to hide because when they're, um, they will be killed. There will be demons actively searching for the Christians. There will be other um, Christians or people who profess to be Christians and they'll be turning on each other to keep from getting persecuted themselves. I believe they'll be tortured and killed. Because Satan doesn't want them want you just to be killed. He wants your soul. He wants he knows what's coming. He knows what's gonna happen. He knows that Jesus is gonna be taken over and he has a very short time. And he wants he he hates us because God loves us. And that's why this is gonna happen. So why don't we talk about the rapture? Um oh wait, I'm not done yet though. So the, um, the way that you can make it, you, the way that you won't miss the rapture is you need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to accept Jesus, the only, only person who has ever lived, who is able to die for our sins because we are sinners. We owe a debt of sin. We have sinned. Everyone has. And just because you're a Christian, that does not mean that you're not going to sin again. It means that you feel bad for it. Um, you feel bad when you sin. You're convicted by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is within you. 
But until we get our glorified bodies that Jesus will be giving us, um, we're still in the flesh and the flesh is sinful. But Jesus is inside of us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us and helps us to become holy. He's still working through us. So don't think because you become saved, you're never going to sin again. That's not true. You will still sin. But once you've been saved, you don't ever, ever have to worry about Jesus turning from you. Or, you know, if you become if you become saved, you're always saved. Always. Nobody can take you from the Father's hand. Nobody. Um, so how do I become saved? It's as simple as A, B, C. First, you have to admit that you're a sinner. If you can't admit that you're a sinner then there's no hope for you. If you don't believe in your heart that you've done things that are horrible or terrible or that you've even done things that maybe you think might not be that bad, but you know they're wrong. If you can't admit that, then there's there's nothing that I can say to you because Jesus came to forgive us of our sins and we are all sinners. So you first, you have to admit that you're a sinner. And then you must believe, you must believe in your heart that Jesus Christ came down from, came down and um, died for your sins and rose again and that he's coming back. You need, you, you need to believe that he is the son of God and you need, and then you need to confess your sins. That's C. You confess your sins and you call on the Lord and you pray and you ask for forgiveness that that's all it is and then you will be saved nothing no good deeds that you do are going to save you it doesn't matter if you if you if you're feeding the homeless of course it matters but it's not going to it's it's not going to save you you can fo- try to follow all the commandments and it's not going to save you we have been saved through grace by faith not of works lest any man should boast we, we, there's nothing we can do. Jesus did it all on the cross. And that is our blessed hope. We need our, our faith needs to be in Jesus, not on anything we do. Cause we're, we're, our, our, our good deeds are like filthy rags. Only Jesus living inside of us can help us to become holy We're not going to get there on our own and we're never going to be holy until he comes and we have our glorified bodies and we leave this, um, the sinful flesh. We will all be changed. And then it's going to be a wonderful time because for Christians, we're going to be going up to the supper of the lamb. We're going to come back seven years at at the end of the, of the, um, tribulation when Jesus says, all right, let's go. And he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years. And then we haven't even made it to eternity yet. Um, A thousand year reign on earth. And then we're going to go into eternity. God is going to be living among us. And we'll be perfect. The reason Jesus, I mean, they, got, the way the world is today, it's, it's horrible. And a lot, some people might say, why doesn't God just scratch it? Kill us all. He can create a new, he can create us again. He can create new man and woman. He can just start over. Why doesn't he just scrap it all and start over? Well, you got to realize God knows who's going to be with him in eternity. He knows the people who are going to be in heaven with him. He knows his sheep and he loves us. He loves us all. He wants all to be all of us to come to him. We were created to worship him. And um, if you don't worship God, you're going to be worshiping something else, whether it be yourself, your phone, the internet, a game. If you don't worship God, you're going to be worshiping something because that's what we were created for, to worship God. So Jesus loves us so much. God loved us so much. He doesn't want to start over. He knows who's going to be in eternity with him. And he says, you're worth it. I'm worth it. His children are worth it. So he's not going to start over. He's going to, um, he's going to keep us because he loves us. 
So we're going to talk about the rapture now. So it's been said that about one fourth of the Bible um, contains unfulfilled prophecy. That means there are a lot of events still coming. For God will not permit his word to go, to remain unfulfilled. It's not going to happen. When God says something's going to happen, he's 100% accurate. And everything he told us that's coming is going to happen. His word will be fulfilled. The next major event in Revel um, is revealed in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and is referred to by Bible students as the rapture of the church. Some object to the word rapture because the word does not appear in any reference of scripture. That's true. But it is also true of the word trinity. Yet many use the word and believe the doctrine. Because the word does not appear in scripture does not discredit the truth. It doesn't discredit the word or the truth. The word rapture is derived from the Latin word rapier. Um, Bake, according to Baker's Dictionary of Theology, it tells us that this word means to seize, to snatch. The word may denote an ecstasy of spirit, such as mystic signs, um, mystic aspires to enjoy, or it may refer to a removal from one place to another by forcible means. Here, it is being considered only in the latter sense, as a phrase of the prophetic revelation dealing with the future of the coming of the Lord for his church. Um, so the, the term rapture is applied to the doctrine of the catching up of believers. Paul uses the term in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 when he declares that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet our coming Savior. The, re um, the Greek word for the word is harpage. This is a big word now. Harpage har harpagesomitha. Harpagesomitha, which comes from the word harpazo. Um, so that means to snatch or catch away, harpazos. The word is found 13 times in the New Testament and almost always implies a change of location of an object, uh, Matthew 12, 29, or a person, Acts 8, 38, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. Um, so there can be no doubt that Paul's language in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 requires a removal of the states from earth at the time of the Lord's return. That is what he says is going to happen, and that is what's going to happen. Um, so who's who, who are the participants of the rapture? What's who's supposed to go? Um, as one as, as you study First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, you find um four participants. The Lord Himself. The Lord Himself is the um the emphatic Pusillian, meaning the same Jesus who died and was resurrected will begin this great event. We see the archangel. Um that might be, maybe, maybe that'll be Michael, or it could possibly be Gabriel, but a lot, a lot of people think, a lot of scholars think that's going to be Michael, um, and that's in Daniel 13, 21, 12, verse 1, and Jude 9, and Revelations 12, 7. Um, believers who have died before this event takes place, they're also going to be participants in the rapture. This is not a general resurrection of all the dead but a particularly one, particular one of believers only. This is clear by the terms sleep in Jesus and dead in Christ. The Spirit of God places us into Christ upon the act of faith on Christ as our Savior. Um, and then the fourth people who will be a participant in this big event is the believers who are alive at the time of this event. Uh, twice Paul uses the phrase, we who are alive and remain. And that's in verses 15 and 17. <laughs> so those are four groups of people that will be involved in this, in the, in the rapture, Jesus himself, the archangel, the believers who have died believing in Christ and believers who are alive at the time of this event. Um, so you should note, however, that while the passage gives us four participants, the emphasis is upon those who are alive and remain. The main purpose of this passage is to show the relationship between those who have died and those who are alive when this event takes place. They were not ignorant of the resurrection. Paul writes then not to teach the fact 
of the resurrection, but rather the fact that at the rapture, the living would not have an advantage over the dead in Christ. Um, the, the people who've already died believing in Jesus, they're going to go first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds and we will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. That's when we're going to get our new bodies. Um, and some, a lot of one, another argument that people have is, well, what if you didn't know Jesus and you died or, you know, the, what about the people before Jesus was even born before any of this, how are they supposed to be saved? Um, from the very beginning, from the garden, God had a plan from the very beginning, God had a plan. And though, um, the Messiah isn't a new Testament, new idea, they were waiting for the Messiah, even in the old Testament. God promised he would send someone um, who would redeem us. And um, Jesus was that person. So people, even before Jesus was born, believed in him. Just like us who are here now, after Jesus died, rose again, went to heaven, and we believe in him now. There were people before his birth who believed in him then. They didn't know who he was going to be, who he was, but they believed in God's plan and the Messiah. So they will, they will be saved. Um, so why were the Thessalonians so puzzled about this relationship? Um, it's because what Paul was teaching them about the rapture was new. Until the time of Paul, Scripture gives us no indication that believers would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, nor that their bodies would be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, as 1 Corinthians um, 15, 51 through 52 um, tells us it was a revelation given to Paul for the church. Um, so you can see Ephesians 3, 1 through 10, um, which was hidden in God. It was a mystery. The Greek word is mysterion. Um, so in the New Testament, it denotes not the mysterious, um, as with the English word, but that which is being outside of the range of unassisted natural apprehension can be made only it can be no, um be made known only by divine revelation and is made known in a manner and at a time appointed by God and to those who were illuminated by his spirit in the ordinary sense a mystery implies knowledge withheld its scriptural significance is truth revealed so when god um hides his words it, it's we don't understand it. There, there may be something in the Bible and you don't understand it. And generations didn't know what this meant. But as we're getting closer to Jesus return, um, the gener um, you know, the generations of our time now have had that veil removed from their eyes and they can see it. And now it's like, Oh, now we know what that means. Whereas before God hid that truth. It was there. The words were there, but it, the understanding wasn't until God removed the veil and um, from our eyes and we were able to know what he was talking about. So um, the revealed mystery is that at the time of the rapture, those who are alive and remain will be changed. The word is the Greek verb alasso, meaning to make other than is, um, to make it to make other than it is, to transform, to change. Um, what this change involves is indicated by the words incorruption and immortality. The word incorruption means unable to destroy and immortality means deathless. In Col um, Colossians 3, 4, Paul tells us when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. In Philippians um, 3.21, he says, this change of our bodies will be fashioned like his glorious body. Nowhere else, except with Paul, do these truths become known. They were written distinctively for the church, for the body of Christ. While many believers believe in a rapture, there is a great division on the place or time it will occur. Some believe it will be, um, it'll, be, uh, it'll occur before the tribulation. Some believe it will occur after. And there's some that believe that it'll, it'll, um, occur during the tribulation period. Now, I personally, I, I believe that scripture supports a pre-tribulation rapture. We are not appointed to wrath. Jesus already paid for our sins. Um, he's already paid for our sins. 
So there is no um, reason for us to think that we would be left behind to suffer the wrath of God. Um, well, while some, while some say there is no direct scriptural evidence to the question, I, 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 I completely disagree. Paul gives us the place of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. The context of the rapper and rapture and the end times does not stop at the chapter division, but continues into 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. A careful study of um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 reveals these, these facts. Um, number one, the context deals with end time events. This is clearly seen in the phrases time and seasons and the day of the Lord. Note also that the text begins with the word but, um, D in the Greek. So this is a word of contrast. Paul is beginning a new subject, but not an unrelated one. The subject is clearly another end time event the day of the Lord. We see this um, description of the, the day of the Lord. It is described as a thief in the night and darkness, verses 2, 4 through 5 of First Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, so it's also a time of destruction and travail. This refers to the tribulation period is confirmed by the scripture. Compare the great passages on the tribulation in the Old Testament. There we read, behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. For the stars of heaven shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause its light to shine. Um, and I will punish the world for its evil, and the wickedness of iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. That's Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. Jesus is coming soon and hastens. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. So the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty, shall, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. That's Zeph, um, Zeph, Zephani, Zephaniel, uh, one, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Um, also see Zechariah um, 14, 1 through 8, and Joel um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and um, chapter 3, 14 and through 21. From this comparison, comparison, it should be clear that Paul is writing about the tribulation period, a time of darkness and wrath. Um, and a, a third reason is, note the believer's relationship to this time of darkness and wrath. There is a contrast between you, us, we. In verses 1, to, uh, 1 through 2, Four, 4 through 6 and 8 through 11, and they and others, um, verses ch chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. So there are two groups of people, those who are not, those who are in or a part of this darkness, and those who are not. It is to those whom Paul is writing that they are not in darkness, verse 4, not of the night, nor of darkness, verse 5, not appointed us for wrath, verse 9. The believer is appointed to salvation. Salvation to or from what? To be delivered from this darkness, the day of the Lord. The word salvation in this context is used in a physical deliverance, not simply a spiritual, for the context demands it. Um, Paul is clearly showing that believers are a part of are, are not a part of that coming day of wrath and darkness. Why? Because they've been raptured from it. This is the message of comfort. Um, chapter 4, verse 18, and chapter 5, verse 10, Paul is, um, Paul is giving us comfort. He says, encourage each other with comfort each other. Um, another passage which may indicate the place or time of the rapture is 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, Paul is writing to assure them that the day of the Lord has not come. As some were teaching, in verse 3, he declared, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In fact, he says that the day of the Lord will not come until two things happen. One is that the Antichrist will be revealed, and the other is the apostia. Two things that students should note here is, um, first, the Greek text has the article, thus the word. The should appear in the translation. Second, the word apostia. It means departure. So the AV um, offers an interpretation of the Greek word, the apostia, instead of translating it and allowing the spirit-taught believer to interpret in context. The words are a falling away. The thought being of a falling away from the um, true doctrine, which is the cause of exegesis, reading into the text that um, which is not there. So the word considered in its historical background and context should be translated departure. The definite article occurring before the word made um, word makes it makes it apply to a particular departure, one known to the writer and the recipients or the letter. It is the departure of the church spoken of in two um, in chapter two, verse one, our gathering gathering together onto him and previously described in detail to the Thessalonians in Paul's first letter to them, cha um, chapter four, verse 13 through 18. There is no definite future event of apostasy recording in scripture, but there is a definite event of departure, um, that of being the rapture. It is noteworthy, though, um, most of the modern translations do not use the word departure. Many of the older translations do, including the Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, and the Tyndale Bible. Um, because these direct scriptural indications are of a pre-tribulation rapture, there are also other indications. Among, um, among them would be the doctrine of em imminence. This doctrine says Christ may return at any moment. Matthew 24, 25, 28, and 31 state that there are events that must occur before the coming of Christ. Um, the Pentecost points this out by saying many signs were given to the nation of Israel, which would precede the second advent so that the nation might be living in expectancy when the time of his coming should draw nigh. Although Israel could not know the day or the hour when the Lord would come, yet they can know that their, redemp their redemption drawing, draweth nigh through the fulfillment of these signs. Um, however, Paul never talks about watching for certain events, um, but rather watch for the Lord himself to appear in Philippians 3. Um, chapter 3, verse 20, Colossians 3, verses four, 3 and 4, um, yeah, Colossians 3, verse 4, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, 1 Timothy 6, chapter uh, verse 14, um, and Titus chapter 1, verse 13, to the church, to the body of Christ, no such sign, <coughs> no such sign was ever given. Um, second, the church as a mystery again. Um, it was no mystery, of the Pentecost, Pentecost writes, it was no mystery that God was going to provide salvation for the Gentiles, nor that Gentiles would be blessed in salvation. The fact that God was going to form Jews and Gentiles alike into one body was never revealed in the Old Testament and forms um, the mystery of which Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 10. This whole mystery program was not revealed until after the rejection of Christ by Israel. It was after the final rejection by Israel that God called out Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles, through, through whom this mystery of the nature of the church is revealed. The church is manifestly an, in, an interpretation, an, an interruption of God's program for Israel, which was not brought into being until Israel's rejection of the offer of the kingdom. So it logically, it has to follow that this mystery program must itself be brought to a conclusion before God can resume his dealing with the nation Israel. Um, the mystery program, which was so distinct in its inception, will certainly be separate at its conclusion. The program must be concluded before God resumes and culminates his program for Israel. So remember, the tribulation period is Jewish in nature. It centers around the land of Palestine and the city of Jerusalem. Um, it's, it's referred in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Jeremiah um, chapter 30, verse 7. Um, so how can God carry out such a thing when in the church there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile? We must return to that distinction, and it will be done when the church is caught up and God resumes his um, kingdom program. Of course, um, there are Jews who are children of God, who have accepted Jesus, who do believe him, and they will be going in the rapture. They are part of the body. Of, they're part of the church. But the tribulation period is a time for God to deal with Israel. It is a time when Israel will come, when the, when the Jews will have, will make their choice. They will choose to believe in Jesus or they will choose not to. And we know that at least 144,000 Jews will accept Jesus and they will be um, saved in the, in the tribulation. And that's what the, why the tribulation, that's why the tribulation. Um, so the purpose of the rapture, we'll talk about that right now, um, to gather together all members of the body of Christ, his church, and to take them to heaven. The epistles made it clear that the church has a heavenly calling. Um, Philippines 1, chapter 1, verse 20. Positionally, we are there now. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 6. We are a part of God's heavenly kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 18. That is our hope. Our purpose in the heaven um, in the heavenlies will be to make known God's wisdom to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10. Um, so in our study, well, let's see here. Um, C.F. Baker's comments are both interesting and noteworthy. He writes, in our study of the heavenly sanctuary, we saw how there was a heavenly counterpart of principalities and powers to the earthly king and princes. Satan and his hosts at the present time occupy this heavenly sphere and it is there that believers have their warfare Ephesians 6 chapter uh, chapter 6 verse 12 after the body of Christ is raptured to heaven war breaks out in heaven and satan and his angels are cast out revelations 12 7 through 21 although it's not specifically stated it would appear that the body of Christ will be given that position once held by angels of ruling with Christ in the heavenly sphere Paul states that we are to judge angels in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, and that we will reign with Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Um, another purpose for the rapture is to judge and reward the church. So to remove the... Um, yeah, um, that's another thing, is we're going to be rewarded. There's going to be... Jesus is preparing a beautiful banquet for us. Um, and he is, when he comes back the second time, he's coming with his um, rewards, his crowns. Um, I believe that we get our crowns at the, at the banquet, um, at the banquet supper. But I don't know that. We'll see. So, um, so he is coming to judge and reward the church. Some of us will go and some of the, some people in the church just, they're not, they don't believe in Jesus, especially today. When we talk about the falling away, people are leaving their faith. Um, I believe that they never had faith because you can't, Jesus will never let us go. He will leave the 99 to find the one. Um, but we're living in a time that there's, people are compromising left and right. They're compromising um, the gay marriage, transgender, all of that that's going on. That's, it's not okay. We believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe that um, Jesus forms us in the womb. He creates us in the womb. And we are people from the moment of conception. Um, and we believe it's murder to shed that innocent blood. So, yeah. Um, we believe that these things that are happening with people, euthanasia is uh, suicide. And in some cases, murder. The church is um, becoming soft. The church is changing their views to fit the world, to become more accepted in the world. Um, we believe that there is one God and Jesus is our savior, that he was God come to the come into flesh and he's the only way to heaven. We believe that. And if you don't believe that, I'm sorry, you're not saved. Um, so the third reason, um, purpose for the rapture would be to remove the restrainer from the earth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. He has always been exerting his restraining influence. Genesis 6, um, verse 3. 
He indwells believers and restrains the work of evil. At the rapture, this restraining power is taken out of the way. Um, yeah, we, the Holy Spirit is in us. And when we leave, we are the church. It's not a building of people. We are the church. Um, and if the spirit of God indwells the church and the church is taken out of the world, then the spirit of God will also be taken out of the world. This does not mean that the spirit will not continue working in the world in some way. The very removal of both the church and the spirit from the world will release the world to sin as it um, never has before. The presence of believers in the world exerts a great influence upon the wicked world. Christians who have stood for civic righteousness and law and order will no longer be in evidence, for the time being at least. Um, there will be there will be one ex um, there will be no one except unsaved people to run government. The net result will be that evil will be, ma be will be manifested beyond anything known in the history of man. Um, the mystery of the iniquity is, of course, already working, as mentioned in verse 7. But the Holy Spirit is now restraining until he is taken away at the translation of the church, at the, um, you know, at the rapture, the rapture of the church. <sighs> when this occurs, it is revealed in verse 8 that then shall the wicked, will the wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the Holy Spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Um, that's the Thessalonians epistles. Um, so how, how we as believers should be looking um, for that blessed hope and that glorious appearance of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Um, Titus, that's from Titus 2.13. There are many, many scriptures, many scriptures that do support a pre-tribulation um rapture um and there are you know there's also there's a lot of differences between the rapture and the second coming one of them is at the rapture the church age believers who sleep in jesus and you know the dead in christ in first thessalonians 4 14 um through and 16 they'll be resurrected and they'll receive glorified bodies in first um corinthians 15 51 through 52 um, so shortly after the Lord's return to the earth, all Old Testament believers who died before the Pentecost will be resurrected and receive their glorified bodies. These are two different events, two different events. Um, shortly after the rapture, church age believers will appear in heaven before Christ for the Bema, for the Bema seat um, judgment. First Corinthians three, chap, uh, verses 10 through 15 and Romans chapter um, 14 verses 10 through 12. So shortly after Christ has returned to earth, all human beings who are then physically alive, both believers and unbelievers, will, appor will appear before the king who will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem for the sheep and the goat judgment. That's Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. These are different judgments. Um, three, only the church age believers, believers in Christ from the Pentecost and Acts 2 until the rapture, will be taken to heaven. Um, John 14, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Christ's second coming to the earth will involve all the people who are then on the earth. Um, and 4, the rapture can happen now, but the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth will only occur after the seven-year tribulation period. That is, after many specific events will have taken place. Um, so the rapture can have five. So the rapture can happen now, but the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth will not occur until such time near the end of the tribulation period. The Jewish generation then living say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23, verse uh, 39. And Hosea 5, um, 15 through 6, uh, through chapter 6, verse 1, um, Zechariah 12 through 10. So no wonder anti-Jewishness um, is increasing as we move closer to the end of the age. Um, and then uh, the sixth reason is the rapture is not revealed in the Old Testament, but the second coming of the Lord to the earth is revealed in the Old Testament. The rapture is a mystery of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. But the second coming of the Lord of the, um, to the earth is not a mystery. 
So chapter seven, at the rapture, Christ meet, not chapter seven, I'm sorry. Um, the seven, seven, um, number seven reason why these are two different events is that at the rapture, Christ meets his followers in the air. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But at his, but at his return to the earth, the king will identify his followers as the sheep who treated his brethren well. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And at the second coming, Jesus will step, come down to the earth and step on the Mount of Olives. He will, he will be physically on the earth. Um, eight, Christ takes his bride to heaven at the time of the rapture, but the Lord's return to the earth. He brings his wife bride back to him with, um, to the earth. Nine, um, only believers will see Christ at the rapture, but when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, every eye will see him. And the tenth reason um, is after the rapture of believers into heaven, tribulation will come to the earth, a time of wrath, when the Lord Jesus Christ leaves heaven to come to the earth. And after the judgment of the sheep and goats, he will establish his messianic kingdom. And that's going to be a time of blessing. The rapture and the second coming are two separate events. In one, we go, we meet him in the air. In another, he comes down with us. Um, from heaven. So we're running out of time. The things that are happening in the world today, I mean, in May, we've got the, Abri the um, Abrahamic Accords. Um, the, those buildings are opening up in May. We've got the Neuralink, which is going to start being placed into humans in May. We've got the Digital Cashless Society, which is um, said to be setting up, um, starting in May. There's a lot of things happening in May. Um, now you don't want to look at dates, but we're, you know, we don't know when the rapture will be. We don't know when Jesus will come. We know he's coming soon because we can see the signs for the tribulation setting up. We can see these things happening when you've got the Abrahamic Accord, a one world, one world religion, one world government, um, setting up and they're ready to unveil it. Um, they're ready to unveil the Antichrist. I mean, he's coming soon. We're not going to be here. Us Christians who believe in Jesus, we don't, we're not going to know who that is right now. There's, there's many suspects. There's many suspects. Um, and I don't want to know who it is. I don't want to be here, but, um, one world religion, one world government, one world economy, all of that is lined up and set up to be put into place. Um, you don't want to be here. I mean, I implore you, please, please come to Jesus. Ask for forgiveness of your sins. Confess your sins to the Lord. You will be saved. All of these things that you see happening in the world right now, these horrible things that are happening in the world, it's going to get worse, much worse, so much more, so much worse. You don't want to be here. Jesus can save you. And I really want to see you in heaven. I want to see you in heaven. I want to meet, see all of you in heaven. I'm going to turn my camera off now. Um, and I will pray for you. And I hope that you're praying for me as well. Please, I want to see you in heaven. Accept Jesus as your savior today. If you haven't already, you don't have much time left. We could go at any moment. Now is the time. Now is the time to believe in our Savior, Jesus, because no one else can save you. The government cannot save you. Nobody else. It doesn't matter who is president. It doesn't matter who the leaders are. Once the church is gone, the Antichrist will be revealed and the tribulation will start. So please come to Jesus today.